Hello, everyone. So let me just recap. Welcome to our session on which is the week two of PyTorch. So today we'll be dealing with PyTorch workflow, how you could train models end to end. So almost every particular workflow follows this streamline, but some things might change depending on the type of model you are building. So we just want to give you like an intuition of how to train your models. So uh, and just a recap in the last session, we talked about tensors, manipulating tensors and working with on uh, GPU devices. So I will just highlight a brief importance of manipulating tensors. So manipulating tensors is particularly important. Let's say you are dealing with a very large, you are training like very on a very large data and definitely you need a very large model. So learning how to manipulate these particular models deals with like kind of segmentations of your data such that it could fit into memory and you could train effectively. So there are kind of two streams this goes, that's data parallelization and model parallelization. So I won't go deep into that just to show you like some significance, even though you might not feel it's significant. So in the future, we'll see how this, it's kind of monumental to bring, to building like very good models. So I will just highlight on a few things, as we said. So what is like the PyTorch workflow? So this is like conceptually like related to this particular notebook. So in other notebooks or maybe some resources, there will be different approaches to how you could, yeah, maybe different approaches to the framing of what a PyTorch workflow is. So essentially there are, in this, it's more of a talk about like six steps. Initially, you know, every machine learning model you build deals with data. So data is fundamental to everything. So, and the data you get while building your machine model, it's not guaranteed to be like really clean in that you could just pass it to your model directly. So you could perform some manipulations on that data. So recalling like the knowledge you had on tensor manipulation, so you could apply those approaches and makes it easy. So I believe in your machine learning, you've done one or two processes to clean your data. So same to apply here, but yeah, just same techniques apply to here. Just that here, it's more of like the PyTorch mindset. And there, yeah, maybe you have been working with SKLN, but similar, you have your normalization, you have feeling of uh, non values, you all have that. You so, next thing you do that. is. Next... Like... So, did someone say anything? Uh, okay. So, next thing you need to do is more of like build your model here. So I'll just be writing just so that at least you could uh, see. So what you have next here is you. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. So what you have next is you try to, sorry, I was just trying to like set up writing on the tablet. So what you need to do next is to build your model. So in most cases you would, but in the fundamental case, you try to build your model from scratch. And, but currently now there are more advanced method of trying to train your model. So you don't need to train from scratch. You could find like uh, pre-built models or pre-trained models and try to fine tune on those models, which is like the approaches most people use for computer vision problems or let's say for your large language models because it's really very expensive to train your model from scratch and i mean like retrain models have kind of learned some future extraction which is easy for you to build up on so most of the models now hardly kind of train from scratch except you are doing something fundamentally different from what is already existing so that's when you kind of try to train from scratch, but keep in mind that it's very expensive. So when you train, when you pick your model, so what next to do is more of like, just try to fit your model. And after that, you try to evaluate. This is just kind of simple intuition of how to go about things. Then improving through experimentation here just implies that, yes, you build your model and it gives you a particular level of accuracy, but how could you improve that to make it better? So that's where you try to do some hyperparameter so tuning and use like management. some optimization techniques to try to make these models better. So 
then let's see what next. So what next is you have these fantastic models that predicts like suitable accuracy for you. That's maybe 99.9% .9 or any accuracy that's suitable for you. Then you try to save this model because you know, like your model is essentially like, it, your model is essentially like, let's say a storage of numbers and you could easily like miss those numbers when maybe you turn off your laptop or your compute environment. So what you try to do is more of like save those particular numbers or any important hyperparameters that you have for your model just so that you could have it uh, on on disk on mem on, on disk particularly and you could easily like kind of store them and or share with someone you want to make you want him to make use of it so that's <laughs> fundamentally like how the pipeline runs so you could see like here in building your model you also get to choose some loss function and there is like a training loop which will go through it and i believe when if you've used scikit learn for your machine learning tax you have not really faced this training loop because it's internal so they do everything for on the surface what you just do is maybe scikit learn dot train or something like that dot model dot fit and it does everything for you but underneath it there is kind of a loop that goes around it so here we'll kind of look deep, deeper into that loop and see how it works so Okay. So let's see. So here's just recapping what we've done. So I'll just try to run these notebooks. And if there's anything, just let me know. And yes. So if there's anything important, don't worry, I will talk to you about it. So as we said, you need to kind of prepare your data. And so as I said, essentially, like everything in your machine learning workflow, it's more of like numeric. Because when you look at computers, what do they understand? They basically understand numbers. So any data you have, it could be of any form. It could be image, it could be audio, it could be what? It could be text, it could be anything. But your computers don't necessarily understand that. So what they understand is more of like the language of numbers. So any data you have, you convert it to numbers. And essentially your model itself is like a combination or an aggregation of a set of numbers. So those set of numbers become, you would say maybe intelligent just for simplicity, just to, they become like intelligent number which crunch on other numbers to just make a prediction. So that prediction can be anything. It could be a number which represents a text. So if you look at it clearly, everything is a number in your machine learning model. So, but on the high level, you have some set of data and the rest. So. Based on my intuition, that's what I would say. Like that's like your complete maybe machine learning workflow. So I would go deep into this. I will just try to give you some ideas and let's see how we could build on those ideas. But there are lots of things you could just go, uh, you could just flow with it. So here, what we are trying to do is, like we said, like you have this, you want to build a system that would be, let's say, intelligent enough to learn the patterns within your data so that you could so that you could predict effectively because when your model learns from your data it could extrapolate and uh, it could go beyond what's available in your data even on scene examples you could kind of pass it to your model and it will work well with it so here what we want to do is we want to generate our data so and like with every so here, the approach we are trying to do is just to build a linear regression model. So you know how the linear regression works, right? So you have something like, uh, let me see if I could change this. So if it's not clear, please just let me know. So you have like y is called to mx plus b, right? So what's your m? Your m here is your what? Your slope, or in a machine learning language, you call it or neural network language, call it your weight, and this is your bias. So fundamentally, what does this mean? So this means we want to build a linear model. So by linear, it means you have like a straight line to predict some values. Let's assume you have like data like this. So your model is trying to build a linear relationship between your 
let's see x which is your input and y here which is your output so here we just want to like kind of build some data sets and we could kind of learn from this data sets so this data set is kind of known to us we know the input we know the output so we want to try to see can the model learn these parameters here which are correct so that's what we want to use, but using like PyTorch. So here is just building a linear regression model with PyTorch. So maybe they might, let me just check the chat if there's anything. And see. Okay, so I think there's no questions for now. So here we're just trying to build a data set. So a very simple data set, but here we have like some width and bias just to know how it is. Then we we'll try to check if our model actually learns this width and bias to make sure like our machine learning model is learning correctly. So here you could see we have the width of 0 0.7, bias of 0 0.3. And here we are just generating some numbers as data sets. So you know how this A range work. You remember, yes, in, in NumPy, you have similar A range. You put in a start and you put in an end and a step. So it starts from your start and incrementally, each subsequent number, the difference between like subsequent numbers are like your steps here, your steps here. Then here you just, uh, in this way here, you kind of give it, you unsqueeze, then you make it to be a dimension of one. So, Yes, or dimension of two rather, sorry. And here you just form your data sets. So let me just move forward. I'll just move it at a more faster speed. So you remember like in your machine learning like sessions you had in the previous session, when you are training your data set, you need to divide those data into like maybe train and test. And but more we could say like uh, more widely, you need to separate into three, three sets, your training, validation, and test. So your training is what your data lands on. Then if you want to, so your training is what your data lands from directly and your test, you can try to see how well your model works on, on scene data. So because usually the case is like when your model trains on the training data and it would learn really well. So in most cases, your model can just memorize that data and it could not extend to unseen, uh, unseen data. So that's why you have these splits. So with the validation set, it's more of like you have, you train on that data, your model can perform wonderfully on the uh, training data. Your validation data helps you to have like some inside look. Yes, it's learning on my training data, but my validation set is, not really performing well, then it helps you like try to, you could attempt to like kind of tune some hyperparameters to make it like work better on both sets. So finally, after you have trained your model, which is acceptable to you based on your training data and your validation data, but be mindful like your model is already exposed to these two data sets. So it's not, it's kind of arguably not, uh, not, kind of arguably you can't really see a model does well because it has been exposed to these two data so it, that's where your test data comes in and your test data is more of like on same data from the outside in which your model you actually try to see how intelligent that your model is so just to kind of brief give like a brief recap because i know maybe you likely have treated this then here you could see this line here is it's more of like uh, performing the uh, you just calculate the number of data you need for your train split. And here you just do the splitting. Yeah, they just take the simplistic approach. They kind of neglected the validation test uh, set. So I would just run this. So here's just a simple function for plotting. So you do know the importance of plots. You are working with numbers, as I said before, but plots give you a better visualization of the problem and you, it's more of like with humans, fundamentally, it's like your eyes is like the most predominant perception you have. So visualization helps you to look at the problem clearly. So which is very good to have like plots and maybe have them if you are repeatedly plotting. So you have them like as, as a module or function you could always call. So 
here we could just predict. You remember, as I said, it's just a linear model. You have this kind of linear representation for training data and your testing data. So then this is the time you need to kind of build your model. So I would run this, but I will just give you some insight to what this is or what this does. So you've treated, maybe I believe you worked with functions, modules, and uh, was in classes and the rest. So I'll just give a brief explanation of this. If there's anything you understand, just let me know and I'll be happy to explain more. So in this first line, you are trying to, in this particular class, you are trying to build your model. So how the PyTorch uh, approach works is you inherit from like an existing, uh, so what you have here is this is, let me see. So this here is like the definition of your class, which like essentially is your model here. Then what you are doing here is more of like you are inheriting from like a base class built by PyTorch, maybe a base model built by PyTorch, but it doesn't fundamentally do anything. So it kind of sets, it's more of like it's setting like the lab ready for you. Then when you use, when you define your model, so you take like all the equipments that are already existing in that lab and you could reuse it. So here you are, like your base lab, you are setting your lab ready here. Then you, you remember what we said, like for a linear regression model, you have like your weights. So here you are kind of, you are initializing, you are kind of, uh, setting out your variable for your M and here to the same thing for your bias. So this parameter here is just initializing a parameter for you. And I believe in your other previous session, you did this where you use like your run. So here, what it is doing, it's creating numbers for you from a normal distribution. So you know how you have a normal distribution. You have like a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So you know how you have your kind of your bell shape. So why is it important for you to initialize your weights and your biases with random values? Because one attempt you could do is you could initialize the weights or bias with zeros so your model doesn't learn effectively. So to give a simple analogy with the brain, with the brain, what happens is your brain based on some certain events or any, let's say, perception of either touch or... Uh, or that so your brain does some kind of... Uh, I didn't know what it is. Can we do your mic, please? Hmm. So if your brain is more of like neurons fire... Kind of neurons are more that or fire. When they see something that reasonably like kind of makes sense... Fine. So when you're in danger, let's say you have like you kind of see the danger in front of you. So okay. your a particular neuron in your body might just trigger <laughs> kind of jump or do something uh to just escape that danger. So something mm -hmm. like that. and when but, you don't set these parameters, run, it kind of takes time to learn. And when it takes yet, or it doesn't learn effectively because they are already dead and they have no energy within them. So it's difficult to try to learn. In some cases, they will learn, but in cases, with uh, or biases that are like initialized to zero. So there are other initialization techniques. So, but we will provide them here. So. Uh, please can we? Mm -hmm. Let me just move. So you find any other description you would in the notebook, but I'll just give you some points. And so here we set manual seed. And there is a question someone asked in the feedback form for the assignment. So how is it something in regard of how or why is the seed important or why should we set the seed? Something like that works. Since I've been, since I've been, 
Okay, so like when you are working with your machine learning model, so it's good because you remember like the advantage we said of certain like weights that are random, so it's easy for a model to train, but exactly. it's, like yeah. these are really random. And like every time you run them, you get different values. But in the sense that you are performing like a groundbreaking research, and I said like maybe let's say 10 years, build uh -huh. model, which uses like some particular kind of randomness, and he got an accuracy of 99%. And assuming he passes on the model to me to verify his results, and what happens, like the model is lower than that, maybe 60%. I begin to doubt what the work he has done. So see particularly important for reproducibility. And in both ways, let's say you are doing research, someone needs to look into your work or you build state-of-the-art model and you want it to perform at that particular point. So you work with seed. So simply you could look at this seed as, when you set the seed, the seed can be any number. So anytime you use that number, it generates the same uh, random number. It's similar random number over and over again so you have the same results so you could think of it as maybe you have let's see some bunch of run numbers let's say seven two five six nine so when you pass in your seed of let's say maybe 42 just take it let's say you have the index one So let's say you have an index of let's say it's zero, one, two, three, up to like the numbers you have. You have lots of numbers. So when you set the seed of let's say 42 here, so what it does is assuming maybe it comes to here, let's say this is our 42, then it picks this number for you. So anytime you pass in 42, it always like goes to this point where which is like of uh index 42 and picks that number for you. So you see, it's always like the case. Anytime you choose 42, it gives you that number. When you choose any maybe higher number or so, it goes to that index and uh, maybe index 530. So it goes to that index and pick that number. So it gives you the same uh, value over and over again. So that's with, that's with, uh, uh, what the man, with setting of your seat. So it's very important to do that. When you try to do experiments, please be mindful of that every time. So here, what you are doing is more of like creating an instance of your model. You know how classes work. So when you have a class, it's you have a blueprint, but it's not really actualizable. You need to instantiate it. So let's say you are an architect and you have this design of a house. So that's like a blueprint. It's not really physical. So when you instantiate it, similar to like an architect. So when you instantiate a class, then you have like a physical copy of it. So that's where you have this model here. And you could easily list your parameters. Remember how we said we have a parameter, which is uh, the weight and the bias. So remember the touch dot run here. So it generates a random number. You pass in a parameter, which is uh, one. So it generates just one random number for you. So depending on the size, it always generates that for you. So you always see this kind of uh, methods, which are used in PyTorch, so always be be willing to look at, at the documentation to just learn more about it. So just quickly, I will run this. And so what happens when you have in, instantiated like your model? So you have this state deck. So as remember what we said, uh, so your model is essentially like a bunch of numbers ordered in a particular way. So this state deck is more of like telling you the current state of your model, like how it is stored, it's more of like the data of containing like information about your model. So which is like stored in a method called state detect. So you could see here, it's like an order dict and it has like order dict of lists. So, so order dict, it's more of like this approach where you have like dictionary, when you call dictionary every time, it's not, guaranteed to come in the same order but order that you kind of freeze like the keys of your dictionary so that it comes in always in the same order but not relatively of much importance for now so 
just know like here we have like a uh, weight stored of this value and you have like bias of this particular uh uh floating value so so what happens next so here we are zooming let's say you your model is already trained but we will train the model so what happens when you have a model you essentially perform inference on your model so inference just deals with hey i've learned this really good model so what next let's say i would say i'm your friend i have this data let's run this data in your model and to get results so that's like inference essentially i built my model so i pass my data to model and i get results that's inference so you're not performing any training at inference time so pytorch has a unique way of setting inference so why is this important to set inference if you would recall like in this previous part we set like requires gradients so how your model learns it's by uh your model learns with gradients so in every particular training step of your loop so it kind of computes the gradients and walk along the path with will i say the greatest gradients to reach uh the global optima so don't worry about these terms we'll discuss them later so with inference mode, these gradients are not calculated. That means your model is in a safe state. So that's the importance of getting into this gradient mode. Not getting into this gradient mode will imply that you passing this data to your model will likely calculate gradients and your model will likely take actions, which is not what you intend in most cases. Imagine you've trained your model and you are passing some data into your model and passing those data can be a bit noisy. It will affect the state of your already trained model so it, which is why it's good to just keep it at inference mode and perform every uh anything you want to do so just quickly i will also rush to some so here you could see like the sample size for your tests and let's say the values of that so here you would also see some predictions so here as you will recall we are starting with some random weights and biases so that's why it's way way off so let's see what our model will learn from this case so and so here essentially what it is doing is you are trying to calculate the relative distance between the true values and what your model has predicted this is very important because in machine learning we deal with loss functions and loss functions kind of tell you how well your model is performing and it helps in so when you know how well your model is performing you could optimize on this to make your model really work better so this is just one of the numerous errors you could come across in either machine learning or deep learning so and you will come to see like this model has it's simple but it also has like disadvantages especially when you are dealing with gradients because it's when you're dealing with gradients, you need to have a model that is differentiable at every point. But this model works well, but it's not differentiable at some particular point, which makes it not really effective. So we'll also look at different errors when we come to do other machine learning problems. And one which you have already come across is the mean squared error, which is particularly good because mean squared error has kind of a unique... Should I go into that? Yes. So I think I will... So mean square, I'll just describe it for the sake of, so that you have the knowledge. So, so when you are dealing with models that have, so mean square error has this kind of error function. This is just kind of pictured in 2D. So, so when you are finding gradients, so your model can easily, maybe it starts at this point, it can easily take step into like the minimum. So this is your goal usually in machine learning to reach like the minimum point where you have, assume this is your error. So assuming this is your error, so don't mind my handwriting. So what you want always to reach the minimum error possible, but that's not always the case because the functions are not always of this particular shape, but it assumably can take this shape, but uh, it doesn't always come like this. That's what you should know. So that's like kind of the difference why this uh, uh, relative distance is good, but not good enough in like most cases. So let me quickly run to, so training your model. So unlike 
maybe the SKLN paradigm in which you simply do model.fit, it's a bit different in uh, PyTorch. So when you have created a class of your model and you have instantiated it, so what next you might need to do is to define your loss function. So your loss function kind of uh, measures the distance between your predictions and the true values. When you have that distance, your model can really optimize on that. And how will it optimize on that using this optimization? So your optimizer defines how your model goes to the, your minimum or maximum point. Imagine, just like we said, let's assume we have this loss function here. So, and your model is particularly at this point here. So how, and we want to reach this point here. So how should your model go down? How should your model kind of slope down from this initial point here? So it is defined by your optimizer. So it's always good. It's a bit high level. No need to think about it for now. So maybe when later you might see different optimizers, there is SGD, Adam, a lot. But by default, one of the key things I will tell you, in most cases, Adam works best. So in most cases, but not always the case. So here's just, it's for simple examples, maybe you could just try out any optimizer and it would work very well for you. You shouldn't bother about that. Then you have the learning rate. The learning rate here implies like, uh, one minute. If I'm going too fast, please, you could stop me at any point. So what the learning rate is more of like saying is how fast should I go down from this particular slope? Should I maybe take this step here? I'm taking like small, small step downwards. Is that what you advise me? Or should I take really large steps to move down. Maybe from here, I could go here and take similar step here. So one thing is clear is you should set, when you set very small learning rates, it takes time for a model to learn. When you set really large learning rate, your model will overshoot like the minimum as we have here and go to this point here. So which is not advisable. So you have to set something in between. So, you know, Machine learning and deep learning are a bit experimental. Experimental with time, you see the best approaches that works for you, and there are different kind of learning rates. Some some learning rates are kind of scheduled in some way and works in a bit of funny manner, but gives you the right results. So yes, so let's go further quickly. So so next thing is I'll just quickly run over here and give you what's essential. So one important thing about working with PyTorch, you have this very important learning loop, which you should always take into account of. So I will give you a key intuition of how this works. So you remember a model that we built initially. So first thing is you have epochs. So epochs is just more of like, it's more of like, uh, how many times should I train my model or how many times should I pass data into my model? So machine learning or deep learning, with reinforcement learning, they are a bit iterative. You just don't pass your model in once and it learns entirely. So you kind of try to pass in the model, uh, your data into a model. It predicts some values, which likely will be garbage at first, and you do it over and over again until it learns from that data. So which is good to kind of set out your epochs, like how many times should I pass in my data into my model, which is particularly this line here. And what happens next? Your model performs some training on the, your database on your loss function and your maybe optimizer. So, uh, or not really, we don't really reach that state. So your model just trains based on your data. So what happens, you make some predictions. So your model already has some values. So when you pass in the training data, it makes some prediction, which is your prediction of your training data. Then what you do is you calculate what is the distance of that prediction that your model makes based on like the true value you actually know, your ground truth. So how, what's the kind of discrepancy or how good has your model predicted? What, yes, then you get your loss. So as we said, like your loss is just a distance. If your model does well, the distance is relatively close, but if it doesn't do well, it's really far apart. So which is simply like the explanation here. So with your optimizer, as we, said initially what your 
models employs to learn like a very good model is using gradients. So when you train a model over and over again, so it accumulates these gradients. These gradients are just simply rate of change. So what you always want to do is like to clear the gradients. Like I train once and it calculated a gradient. So I don't need that gradient anymore. I clear the gradients out, which is like zero grad. Just, I don't want to just clear your memory. I want to start something afresh. So then next is what you do loss.backward. So loss.backward in PyTorch, and I believe like with TensorFlow, we have this uh, computational graph. So if you look at it uh, from your model here, it goes into like the loss here. And the loss you have like this Y and train. Then here you are trying to go a bit backward. So we are saying based on the loss that I've gotten, which is also based on your prediction and your uh and your ground value, which is the screwed value, which uh going backwards is based on your model. So how can I optimize my model just to make it better? So it's more of like you are recursing backwards. That's like the where the backward comes in here. So your model kind of calculates this backwards and does the entire calculation for you. So maybe you could look at the mathematics behind that. And uh, but here, this is like the simplistic explanation for this. So let me just clear this. And uh, so given you have gotten like the gradients from this point here, you have the gradients. So here, what you want to do is maybe perform step. So step is more of like, let's say I have presumably some change in some particular quantity. So this step here is it's saying like, based on my parameters, I want to, this is my old, and based on like the gradients you calculated, I want it to this to be my new. So internally, it makes that, uh, it makes that computation. So in most test books and the test books we shared for additional resources, you see that math, but here there's no much of math in this uh, particular resource. So if you are really interested in learning that, you could go into it and you learn more. And yes, so I think that's what it does fundamentally. That's like your training loop. After then, then you try to evaluate how well is your model working. So let me just clear this and see how quickly we will go. So, like we said, we are using mean absolute error. So it's just, so with mean absolute error, it's more of like you have, let's see your model. Let me see how I explain. So you have your true prediction is, let me say, uh, four, two, three, and your model prediction is maybe three, zero so your absolute error is more of like for here we are considering just one data point so it's more of like 423 minus 320 then you have the absolute value which is let's say 103 so this one for one data point but let's say you know your data has multiple points that's like the size of your let's say training data for this case which is 40 so you get the average of maybe 103 and the other like average the other values, then you average them. Let's say in this case, 40. So that's how like in very simple manner, what's your mean absolute error? But I'll be very glad to go over it in case if there's anything. And uh, let me see, okay, I'll just explain the next steps in three minutes and just look if you have any questions, then answer them. So I would, so like we said here, it's very good to visualize, you know how your model is working. So you have your equities here and you have like the loss, which is like how well your model is performing. So in this loss, the lower, the better. That's what we always want. So as you could see, as your time increase that you are training the model, the loss is actually going lower and lower and lower. Initially what happens, it's really high. So your training loss is low as expected. Then your test, which is the data your model doesn't see at all. So it's high. So you could see like it's a bit high, then your training loss, it's also kind of decreasing with time, which is much expected. So it's your test loss, 
which this is like the conventional way you should see it, but it's not always the case. So I think I'll just give one example and I believe we would, okay, I think after, so what happens, let's say, assuming in this case, you know, here you have your train loss is lower than Tesla, which is expected because you are training based on your training data. But there are cases in which, let me just give some simple explanation. Okay, I think I should use, yes. So, let, me use. let me assume like you have this, you have your epoch here and you have like the loss here. So let's say, let me just use the same color. Let's say this is your test. Let's say this is your test and this is your train. Can you, okay, this is your train and this is your test. So like we said, like, this is like the conventional, this is what should happen. But in some cases you will find this happening. So can you give any, briefly any idea, just very shortly in less than two minutes, uh, maybe why this might be the case? Let me just come to the chat just so that I could just interact with you, please. So why do you think overfitting? Yeah, which the, is, data, yes. the training data is not enough. That the model did not learn a lot. Yes, correct. So that's, so when uh, someone said overfit, which is a good answer, but maybe not so correct. And someone said when train data is not enough, which is, yes, which is also like a very, which is a good uh, suggestion. So what I can see for me, when train data is not enough, it's, it's very possible. So what I can say is like your training data has less difficult examples. So it's difficult for a model to really learn like the fundamental like kind of mapping between your input and your output. So when your training data is not difficult, so your model doesn't really learn something. Let's say it's maybe on the feet. And let's say your, oh, sorry, I'm mixing it. So let's say when your training data, sorry, has really difficult examples. So it's hard for a model to learn. So it underfits the model but your test data has simple examples. So you would see like the loss function, it's better for your test data. I don't know if it makes sense. Your training data has really complex examples and it's tough for your model to learn, causing the model to underfit. But your test data has simple examples and it easily kind of works well with your model. So that's one case you could see this. I just wanted to give you this, but there are different, uh, red graphs you will see so it's always good to plot just don't look at the final value of your accuracy or your loss and make some judgment over that so that's what i'll say so briefly i'll just highlight over some few points and please you would spare like some few maybe less than three minutes and we will be done so i will just quickly go into you saving making inference i think we've discussed this and we've looked at this so finally, it's more of like you storing and loading like your PyTorch model. So you have this quick function, which is the save and dot load. So as we said, like you have the information of your model in this save dict. So which, like I said, your models are just functions, are just numbers, sorry. So it could have like some bit of extra appendage of names you might call like weight or bias to distinguish each component from each other. So, but when you are dealing with very large neural network, let's say AlexNet, for instance, and AlexNet is more, a simple description, it's more of like a computer vision model and uses convolutional neural network and you have a stack of multiple layers. So what you do is you name those layers and it's easy for you. But like when you look into it, what fundamentally derives those model is numbers, which is very good for you to know. So you have that dict and you could easily save those dict using like pickle. So you have this like pickle file and you could either share with me or your friend, you have this fantastic model you've trained and they could also easily work with it. And yes, I think that's majorly it. So, but later on just to give you some 
maybe extra, you could be training really large models, like especially with the development of LLMs. And it's very difficult to maybe, yes, you could share those weights because usually now what people do, and I think with which company was it? Not really anthropic. So what they do is they just share their weights using some kind of torrent. So easily you could just download those weights and you could utilize them for what you do. But what I wanted to tell you is, okay, maybe I think that's enough. So putting everything together is more of like a recap of everything. So yeah, so I think that's, I'll just stop here, please. And let me just take your questions if there are anything. And uh, yes. So if there are anything, so I would really appreciate your feedback every time. So I would love to maybe improve and see what to do better. And please, I just like how you are interacting with the class with the course assignments. So please keep it up. So, and if you have any other questions, so for this, I have uploaded like the first part of your exercises or assignments will still be like, you go to this notebook and there are exercises here, please answer them. And there will be like more of like, uh, maybe advanced exercises. I haven't uploaded them, please, but maybe bear with me by tomorrow or so, I'll upload them. So it will be, it will be simple questions, just more of like to build your understanding on things. And then, yes, I'll just upload them and you will see them. So I think it will reflect based on your previous one and this current one. So they won't be difficult, don't worry about it. So someone say I should explain random seed. So random seed, so we have discussed like the importance of random numbers. So imagine, so with random seed, it kind of help you to make your like machine learning model or pipeline reproducible because like the name goes, it's random. So any random event, it doesn't really occur like, uh, doesn't occur like always, when I see it doesn't occur every time. So with this random seed, like we said in the last lecture, like with computers, what they use is to do random numbers. So with this random, what's the name? with this random seed, what you have, like it generates the same random number every time you want to use it. So that's, uh, that's how the random seed works. So you could set a number. And when you set that number, you could get like, uh, any random number it generates for you, it generates that for you in every run. So it's easy for to reproduce your results and experiments or to keep your model the way it is every time. Yes. So, but that's just like a simple analogy, but underneath it, I don't uh, fully know how it works. And then I think there is Fatima, please. I think she's the first person to hand up. All right, so I'm Good evening. <laughs> Please, uh, I need more explanation on the difference between inference mode, zero grand, and loss back, backward. Okay, inference mode, zero grad, and loss backward. And loss backward, yes. Okay, the difference thanks. between them. Okay, let me just, uh, okay, let me just explain again. Let me share my screen in one minute. And, uh, okay, Sani, I'll come to you in one minute. So, so I, uh, so I assume like you know how you have your machine learning model. So I will start with inference mode, then I will easily touch the other parts. Yeah. So, so inference mode is take it very simple. I have, let's see, I have this, which kind of mode? Let's say I have this linear regression model or random forest model, which I have trained and I'm very satisfied with that model. So what it means by inference is like, I have this model, you just pass in your data and you get your results, that's inference. So it's very as simple as that. Let's say you have a model that does a prediction, you've trained it. So by inference, it just means the process of you passing in your model. And when you pass in your model, it kind of gives like some predictions. So that's inference. So like one- pre -trained? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry, you wanted to say something? I said like pre-trained model. Uh, yes, I think you could look at pre. Yes, you could look at pre-trained model in 
various spheres. Let's say you take a computer vision model that is pre-trained. It's also, you could use it as inference if it's pre-trained to do your tax. Let's say you kind of download this fancy AI model that detect, that detects faces. And when you pass in your, you, you just perform inference. If it does what you are, you want it to do, you just pass in your model and you get your prediction. So that's inference. Inference is just more of like, uh, let me see. Reusing of existing model. Uh, not yes yes you could yes you could put, easily put that down. so you know let's say you have this let's say good model so inference is more of like uh, so you pass in your x and you get y so this process here is called inference so here assuming your model is already trained and it works well for you so yes so that's inference thank you uh, nice. And let me just explain the other part for you. So sorry, we are taking extra time. And so you talked about zero grad. So like we said, what in your machine learning model, zero grad is more of like, so let's say you have this loss function here. So here is like, uh, let me see, this is your loss. And this is maybe some parameters of your model. And uh, let's say you start up from you start off from this point. So what you want is you try to you want to get to this point here. You want to get to this point here. So when you get to this point, you know like you have like zero loss, like your model has really learned, learned really well. So how will you get to this point? So how you do that is you try to take gradient of this point, like your dy dx. So it tells you like, hey, move towards this direction here. It has like a larger gradient. So when you move towards the gradient, you are almost guaranteed to reach this spot. So every time you, at every approach, you calculate this gradient here. So when you have calculated that gradient, what happens in zero grad is you don't want to use the previous gradients you want because your previous gradient is based on some parameters and you have calculated the gradients and you have updated those parameters. Now you are trying to calculate the new gradients of like the next parameters. So it's a good idea to clear your gradients here. So that's like zero grad. Let's see, I have this variable called gradient and in the initial run, I equal to zero, it has saved my gradient to be 0 0.387. So here and I'm in I is equal to one. So what this zero grad is simply doing is just maybe gradient is equal to zero then it calculates another better gradient for me based on my current parameters. So that's uh, the explanation of zero grad. Sorry, my handwriting is a bit bad. Then you talked about uh, backward. So to explain it simply, I would say backward is more of like, I've taken like this chain of steps. I have my model. I have like my loss function loss function so backward is more of like hey look i have this model and you have calculated some kind of metrics as my cost function so and i want to improve the model so how will you improve the model if you remember everything of your model revolves around the parameters so everything is just the parameters so you want to like kind of change your parameters in some way it's more of like you have like some audio volume so it's too loud, it's not too loud, and you are trying to adjust it. So with this loss function, it's more of like you have evaluated based on your current prediction, the true value. Maybe it's not good enough. So with backward, it's more of like you try, you tell it to, hey, look backward, take everything you've learned about how good my model is and kind of like optimize, optimize the parameters of this. So that's what backward does. So backward does like a backward differentiation. It calculates how, what change it needs to make to make your model better. So, and it takes that next approach by utilizing this uh, optimizer dot step. All right, so, thank you, sir. I uh, know it's a pleasure. And uh, mm -hmm. Sani Aji, please. Okay, thank you, sir, for the explanation.
My Good question job. is on this um, validation test because um, I'm just wondering, is it necessary to always validate? Because most of the times I only see mm -hmm. the testing part. So at what point are we validating? He, honestly, I can't see. I think maybe based on what I think is, because let's say maybe your approach you usually use is, let's say, assuming you have two sets, you know, you have your training and your test score. So you train on your training data, right? Then your test is more of like, so in the case you use your test, we assume it to be validation sets. So what happens when you kind of think from the outside, your training, you have exposed your model to your training set, which is like everyone of us know. Then the test set, it you have exposed it also to the model because when you look at it, your model, you are connected to your model, you see the performance on your of your model in some way. And it's more of like, it's much safer to do that. Because like, let's say you train on your model and you're using, maybe your approach, you just use test set. So you are adjusting your model based on that test set. So or am I saying default way? So I'm just thinking, how better can I say? So imagine you, Yes, you train your model on your training set, which is fine, which is all what we do. Then validation set is more of like, how can I make those little changes so that it will become better? So test set is more of like something entirely different from another different world. So imagine you are trying to predict the performance of students in a class based on maybe their age or some particular properties they have. And let's say you are considering maybe class five and six. So what you do is maybe for class five or let's say maybe cohort one and two. So what you do is you pick like some students, let's say you are considering out of your cohort one, you break it into train and test. You train your model based on like some students from cohort one. Then the other part of cohort one, use it for validation. So your validation is more of like, for your validation set, you are still using it to tune the model in some sense. So that means it's exposed to the model. But let's say you, assuming you want to consider like a different class, which is like, let's say cohort two, for instance. So your model hasn't seen that. So it's a very good testing bed for a model. So that's what I would say. So like in the default case, you use like train and test. And you, I would say like they're all exposed to your model all along. So maybe that's what I would say briefly. But maybe I'll just check more on it and see if there's anything, or if anyone wants to share, I'll be very glad to listen. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, no uh, Munzali, please. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for this uh, intuitive. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No my question is regarding the linear regression model subclassing. Oh, Am I audible? Uh, not so Hello, much. Am, yeah, am I, yeah. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, I said my question is regarding the uh, linear regression model subclassing. Um, okay, I'm so not ju just uh, very clear on how the forward. Okay. How the forward function is defined. Okay. More specifically, the first line of the forward um, function. Yeah, ah. I'm not very clear about it. Okay, so I will just try to explain briefly, and maybe I will send some maybe very good resource for you to look at. So, but I'll just explain briefly because of the time of others. And uh, yes, so here, but sorry, just quick question. You understand what's bias and your weights? So I think I'll just explain briefly. So with this, what this does is, you have a class, you know how to install, you know how to create like a class. A class is just a Python data structure. So what PyTorch has done for you is they have like a base class, which is nn.model. So it houses maybe all the necessary tools in PyTorch you could use for creating a neural network. So let's say you are not going to do the advanced stuff. So what you try to do is they have this, let's assume this nn model is like a lab, you have this ready made lab for you to try to start to create your neural network. So what you try to do, hey, I've seen that you have this fantastic lab, but I would like to make it better. I like all the tools you have in build, 
but I also want to create a version of my own that is maybe better in some way. So that's when you try to create a new class. And what happens in that lab, you just try to instantiate, like you try to instantiate you, it's more of like inheritance, like assuming you are still looking at it based on the class scenario, you instantiate, maybe you still create the lab and maybe put everything ready so that you could use the lab. But looking at these extra lines, you say, hey, look, in my extra lab, I want to use weights and bias. I know what's good for me. So these are like the two things I want to do. So in creating this, what happens is you are more of like, assuming you're an architect, so you are kind of creating a blueprint for a house, but it's just on paper. So what you want to do is actualize the house into, let's say this is a real world kind of system. But here is just more of like, you are dealing with like a blueprint here. It's still on paper. So here you are saying that in my house that I want to build, I or in my lab right, that I want to build, I have this weight and I want you to start with these biases, set them to a random number, this and this. So that's what you are saying in that case. So, and you are telling your model that I have, I need this particular, okay, sorry, maybe I didn't explain this forward. I think it's my fault. So I have this particular forward method. So what I want the forward method to do is to perform this operation. I want it to add my width and my bias. So if you remember, we say like in linear regression, you have this MX plus B, where this is your width and this is your bias, and this is your data. So with Python, with Python they have this particular paradigm of forward. So forward is more of like, it kind of details like the computational graph of your model. So how your model should work, that's like computational graph. So it's saying like, hey, look, this is like, uh, let me just cancel this. And okay, I think there are some few questions. I'll just answer briefly so that we could move into something so that all of us will have some free time. Uh, so let's say you have like, assuming this is your model, so with forward, is you are telling me like, take this input for me from my weight and take this input for me from my bias and perform this operation of addition, then return the output Y, return the output Y. So imagine your data comes in here X, so it will return like the Y for it. So that's what the forward does. It's just like a computational graph. It takes inputs and outputs. So you define the computational graph based on like the properties you feel like your model will have. And you know, this is what, how, what is defined here is how uh, linear regression works. So that's forward. Like forward, you take my, how it should move forward your data in your machine learning, in your PyTorch model. So, so everything about your model, every information about your model, you set it in init here. So how the flow between like those information of your model, it happens here in forward. So forward defines like the flow of your data and uh, and like how your parameters affect your data. Yes, but this is like simple explanation for models, it could get really complex, but they all follow the same thing. Then briefly, I think Abdullah talked about ask. I'm not sure if it's a question back propagation. So, but if it's a question, let me know. So then there's a question from uh from Bala. What happens if we assign the grad as false? So if okay, thanks. So if we assign the grad as false, you your model won't really learn. Your parameters will be static because it's I'm assuming that because like what you are trying to learn, you are trying to learn an optimal model model using gradient descent, which fundamentally uses gradients. If you set required grad as false, it's more false. You are more of like storing a constant value. So nothing will change in your model. Your model won't improve or become better. So I think that's uh, that's made my explanation for that. So I think with this, we'll just close so that I won't interfere with your time. But please feel free to send questions in the group and happy to answer them. And uh, yes, with the assignments, I'll update you if there's anything. So let me know if there are anything you are confused with. So I will call it a day, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh,
Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you.